Thanks for coming. First of all, I just want to say uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in Minsk. Uh, I've worked and met so many people from Belarus, and it's my first time here, so I'm very excited to, to be here. Uh, it's also my first DevGam in, in some time. Uh, I've been to a lot of DevGams and back when it was called FlashGam, a long time ago. Um, but uh, it's great to see how large the event has, has grown into and, and that there's so many really talented developers here in Minsk. So um, my name is Steven. I'm from Deca Games. Uh, I'm here to talk about live operations. So uh, before I do that, just a really quick survey for you guys. Um, how many people here are game developers? If you're a game developer, can you raise your hand, please? OK, great. So everyone here, almost everyone's a developer. You guys are not game developers. OK, got it. Good. OK, awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, so before I get into the, the topic, uh, just a quick word about Deca Games. So we're a publisher, but completely different from other publishers because we don't actually launch new games. Instead, we focus on live operations, which I'll explain to you in today's talk, uh, live operations and games as a service. The company is a little over two years old, um, and most of the senior leadership comes from a lot of the companies that you see on the right-hand side. So we really understand free-to-play games. Um, and we're headquartered in Berlin, but uh, we have a distributed team. So we have people throughout the world, mostly in Eastern Europe and also North America. So um, for myself, I actually worked at a company on the bottom right here called Six Waves. We're a very large publisher in Asia and, and on Facebook as well as in Japan. So um, anyway, why, why, live, why live operations? Um, it's a topic that people don't fully understand, but you hear a lot about it. A lot of times when I meet game developers, they say, well, you know, I've got a really great game. We're getting ready to launch it, um, but now I'm working on the live ops. And, and this is an approach which I think is um, not the best way to success. Um, most of the time, people are thinking about live ops as just events or updates, things that you do when you're getting ready to launch the game to keep it going. And what I'm here to explain today is that it's a, lo a lot more complex than this. Um, and, and when I first started uh, in the publishing business, uh, a little over eight years ago, it was relatively understood and predictable if you can make a game successful. So back in those days on, on the Facebook platform, you just had to, it was all about the size of your network. How many DAU do you have in your network? <clears throat> and when you launch a game, you can cross prom promote it within your network, you can spend money on marketing, and if the game is strong, there's a good chance that you'll get good results. Uh, nowadays, it's a much, much more difficult to achieve results. And I think uh, the main reason for that is because of marketing. Marketing has become really, really expensive. And even for the most, you know, biggest companies in our, in our industry, it's not a sustainable model. I'll show you what I mean. So um, <clears throat> this is sort of the traditional marketing user acquisition funnel. So um, at the top of the funnel, you have mark. Uh, Developers and publishers spending thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of dollars to acquire users. And, and uh, unfortunately, this is not a one-to-one -one proposition. So I spend one dollar, I'm probably not getting one user back. Um, depending on the, the type of game that you're working on, the genre, you could be spending six, seven, eight dollars to acquire a player. And at every single step down the funnel, you're losing players. So um, if you look at the retention numbers for, for the best games in the industry, after one day, maybe a quarter of them or even half of them are gone. Um, for the, even the best games, after 30 days, you've got you know, maybe 90% of them are, are, are completely gone. So that's money, hard-earned money that you're never going to get back, right? Um, and even you know, if you are able to retain those players, a very, very small percentage of those players are actually going to spend money in your game, right? So indus industry standard is something like 2%. So, so you're spending tons of money at the top of the funnel, at the bottom of the funnel, you're getting very, very little back, uh, except maybe if you're a, a really, really, really strong uh, publisher already. So I, I, would, I would argue that this is not a sustainable model. Even for the large players in the industry, you can see they're not spending 365 days anymore. They're also having to be very selective about when they spend money. So that doesn't mean that marketing is not important. Um, it's really important to have a great marketing strategy and plan and partners in place. But it's not everything anymore, and I'll show you what I mean. So what comes next after you've done all the, your launch marketing? Well, your game will, will get older over time. You're acquiring less users, so you're making less revenues. Um, and those players that, that have been with you from the beginning, 
um, they're starting to reach the point where you have to come out with new content for them because they've spent money in the game and they expect more content, new updates. Um, at the same time, over time, your team wants to work on new, new products, new items. They start to get bored. Um, when they are less interested, the players are also less, less interested, and, and they'll also churn. So this is a, a problem that happens to everyone. It doesn't matter how big, how small you are. Um, over time, you will not be able to fully support all of your games. Um, <clears throat> so what, what are my options? So traditionally, there's sort of two things you can do. Behind door number one, you can keep the game alive. So I can leave it there in maintenance mode. I don't do anything with it. Or I can maybe put a small skeleton team, or I can maybe give it to a work for hire studio. And, and this is not ideal because you're not really paying attention to the game anymore. Um, door number two, sunset the game. It's too expensive to keep it running. I'll just shut it down. But what I would like to describe today is live operations, which I like to call door number three. Um, as I mentioned, it's a very misunderstood um, topic in the industry. Most of the time, people think it's all about uh, KPI and very tactics driven, and I can you know, run this sale and very quickly spike the revenue. It's a lot more complex than that, and it's a lot more than just events and updates. Um, internally at DECA, we actually define it as legendary live ops, and, and what is that? Um, for us, we say creating an experience that players will come back to daily for decades. So it's not a tactic, it's actually a, a holistic approach and experience. It's something that's not tacked on at the end. You have to, you have to think about it from the very beginning. Um, quick uh, trivia, the word decade actually means 10 years, and, and that's one of the reasons why we're called Decade Games, because we believe that for a strong game, we can operate it for 10 years. And I'll show you what I mean. So um, case study that I'm here to talk about, uh, it's a game called Realm of the Mad God. So um, this was an indie hit. It's actually a PC free-to-play co-op game, pretty hardcore. Um, it's a permadeath game. Uh, it was an indie hit, uh, and it was purchased by Kabam back in 2012. Unfortunately, compared to Kabam's largest games, it really wasn't making a huge difference for them. So um, within two years, they had a small skeleton team, and we feel like they really didn't have a chance to, to succeed. Um, so we acquired the game a little over two years ago. Um, we saw a lot of potential in the game, but we just had to figure out how to unlock the, uh, the potential of this game through live operations. So what's the first thing we did? <clears throat> well, the first thing we did was actually play the game as much as possible, but um, more importantly, the first thing we did is find our super fans. So who are the super fans in the game? They're these guys. Um, this is from BlizzCon recently, but essentially the word fan uh, in English is short for fanatic. And your super fans are guys that have been playing your game since day one. They're hardcore, they know the game, the ins and outs of a game, probably better than even some of the people in your studio. Um, and they love the game no matter what, right? And um, so the first thing, I mean, no matter the size of your game, I guarantee you there are some super fans somewhere. You just have to find them. So for us, for Realm of the Mad God, we managed to find these guys on Reddit. And we were able to engage them fairly quickly and start talking to them and trying to learn as much as we could about the game so we can understand how to approach uh, operating the game. <clears throat> so from talking to our super fans, we found out very quickly that we had a problem, and I'll show you what I mean. So this is the core loop of the game. So uh, when the game first came out, it was actually really fun, but it lacked depth. So Kabam added this uh, upgrade system in, in the orange where you can you know, have pets and you can fuse them and uh, it added a lot more complexity to the game and increased revenues, but it also created a lot of churn. It actually divided the players into two camps. So you're, for your paying players, the game became too easy. Um, you know, they paid money and they're able to pretty much kill everyone. Uh, for the non-payers, it was really unfair. They didn't really like it, so we lost, a lot of players were lost by Kabam because of this approach. Um, so there's this really big divide between the player base um, and it was, for us, it was a really tricky situation because we could not just remove this feature, we couldn't just nerf it, we had to figure out how to tackle this. So uh, we were talking to our super fans about this, understanding their frustrations, and they started to understand that, okay, uh, these guys really understand our frustration and they're starting to you know, think about how we can make things better. So uh, even though we hadn't really changed much in the game yet, the, the, the fans of the game were really excited. Uh, so they were so excited that someone was finally paying attention to them after all these years. So when we finally took the game over, it actually uh, became the number one subreddit on Reddit. And um, we also took the opportunity to use social media to build momentum and build buzz to the game. So there were a lot of people that actually played the game in the early years. 
um, that were kind of lurking around, and they still follow the game on social media, and we were able to uh, get them excited about the game as well. So the next thing we did uh, was actually enlist some of our most passionate super fans, uh, because these are some of the most knowledgeable people about the game. They knew the game much better than we do because they've been playing the game since, uh, basically since it launched. So we actually hired some of the, the super fans and brought them under DECA Games to work on the game with us. So uh, on the left, we got them involved in game balancing. On the right, we actually en enlisted a lot of uh, players to be beta testers for us. So we had an idea of, of the things we wanted to do in the game to improve it. But these super fans were able to give us much more detailed feedback about the best ways to exactly implement this. So um, it was really, really valuable to actually leverage the knowledge that they already have, and they would happily share this with us because this is new ideas, and they're really happy to, to contribute and share their feedback. On top of that, we also invested in a lot of tools uh, to allow players to customize the user experience, so user-generated content. So on the left, you can see uh, players were able to design their own skins for their characters within the game. Um, I think nowadays, if you look at you know, a lot of big games, Fortnite, et cetera, you know, cosmetics are, are, have become a huge revenue stream in, within our industry. And <clears throat> I like to think that with Realm, we were a little bit ahead of that curve and, uh, in terms of uh, user skins. On the right, we also allowed players to design their own dungeons. So uh, again, players have been with the game since day one, and they understand the best type of experiences that they would like to play together with their friends. So instead of us coming to the players as, hey, we're Deca Games, we're some developer, and, and here's some new content, uh, we're approaching them as players. So uh, these are their own fellow peers designing content that they can play with their peer group and with their friends. So it's a very... Uh, different distinction, but it's very important for our players to, to see and accept new content coming from their own friends and people that they've already played with. So uh, if you remember the previous game loop, um, this is kind of how it looks today. So everything on the left in the blue is kind of what we added once we took it over. So we de-emphasized the, the red in the middle, the pet system, which was so divisive and, and the players hated. Um, so, you know, we basically increase the drop rates and, and also decrease the up, uh, upgrade costs to make the game feel less like pay to win, which was one of the, the main complaints that players had. And at the same time, we also emphasized the customization on the left. So the player created skins became the rare items which people would try to chase in the game. So it actually became a very, uh, I would say, virtuous cycle. Um, which we didn't totally plan from day one, but it worked out really well for us. And, and because the content is generated by users, it also requires us to, to be able to you know, develop the game and maintain the game with less overhead on the development side and on the design side of things. And even compared to Kabam, who's operating the game from North America, we're already becoming more profitable right away. So on top of that, um, we were extremely, this is super important, we're very, extremely rigorous about maintaining the game as best we can. Now, these are things which uh, are very, very difficult to quantify in terms of numerical value, in terms of ROI, but we have found that they are really, really crucial. So every two to three weeks, we're talking to our players to understand, okay, what are they doing right now? Are there, are there any bugs that they're exploiting that we need to patch up? Are there any things that need to be cleaned up? Especially with an older game, um, you have old game you know, running on new tech, um, you have to be really careful to make sure that the player experience is going to be the same. And if it's not, you should try to fix it and make sure your players are still able to enjoy the game as much as possible. So actually, this game originally was in Flash, and we found that people are still playing the game in Flash and finding ways to figure out how to play it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so definitely um, be rigorous about what's going on with your game, check on the health of the game, how's the quality of life, what are players happy about, not happy about. And the whole time we're doing this, we're talking to the players and letting them know what's coming. So as soon as we roll something out, if they're not crazy about it, they will let us know right away. It's a, it's a very, very transparent, very direct dialogue. Um, if they do like it, that's great validation for us. But if it's not, we can roll it back. We can try a new direction and see if they like it. So um, this whole time, you're maintaining trust with the players so they understand what's coming, and they know that they have your support. So, how did we do? So um, we've taken the game over for a little over two years now, um, and here are the results. So in terms of DAU, since we took the game over, 
we were able to double the DAU. Um, and DAC, uh, w that's an internal term which we uh, call daily active customers. Basically, this is your paying players, how many people are actually spending money in the game. Uh, we were able to triple that. Um, and this is the, the revenue trend of the game. It's, I can't share the real numbers with you, but um, the game is over eight years old now, and we're now having a record year in terms of revenue. So, and that's pretty hard to see in the industry for in a game that's over eight years old. Um, and most importantly, we've done all of this with no money spent on marketing and user acquisition. So um, it's purely by focusing on live operations and understanding what your diehard players want, listening to them, and giving them exactly what they want and earning that trust and basically building uh, a loyalty with them. So um, <clears throat> if you remember the traditional marketing funnel where you're spending tons of money at the top to maybe retain a very, very small set of users at the bottom, we basically decided to take the opposite approach. So we have an existing smaller base of super fans. We work really closely with them, get them really engaged, excited, and they actually help us to re-engage their friends, re-engage people that they used to play with. They help us build a buzz as well. Um, and then the whole time we're coming out with new content, we're talking to them about it and building trust, building loyalty. Um, and that's really been the key for us to success. It's not by focusing on marketing, but by focusing on live operations. So uh, for, for you guys in the room that are game developers, I would actually ask you, what I, what I would encourage you to do is find out where are the super fans for your game. Let's find out where they are. Let's talk to them. Let's understand what they're looking for. Um, because they clearly love your game, they've been there for a long time, and if you can really understand what they're looking for and give them what they want, they'll reward you with genuine passion and hopefully revenues as well. So um, this is kind of the, the last slide that I have. Um, it's a screenshot of, of Realm of the Mad God, and basically it's the, the player community coming together to, to show us um, how much they love what we were doing with the game. So um, with that, um, I know your time is valuable. Um, I'm really glad you chose to spend it with me today, so thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Steven. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Good, I love questions. Hello. Hello. Uh, so, uh, probably not every game deserves the live ops option, right? Some mm -hmm. of them probably be better to <laughs> shut down. Mm -hmm. So, how do you take this decision? Make this decision, I mean. So probably there are some indicators you are Yeah, watching. exactly, yeah. Obviously, you know, everyone kind of looks at the same KPI. Retention is really important. Um, if, you're if you're trying to measure them, I would definitely rank retention over revenue because, um, you know, revenue can, can definitely be something which can be tweaked, but retention is usually not pretty hard to solve. Um, for us, the most important consideration was, one, we really liked the gameplay. Um, our team was really passionate about it uh, because, you know, we're not looking to take on a project uh, if we're not excited about it because we hope that they can work with it for many years. Um, and then also the community was the, the, the key aspect for us because um, as we were looking at the, the numbers, um, the, the number of players, the DAU of the game was pretty steady. And that, that told us that, okay, there's a diehard community here that no matter what happens, even though there's nothing going on in the game, they still love it. And, um, that's something that we, um, is a good indicator for us that we can work with them. Uh, hi, Stephen. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. It was very good. Um, I was just wondering whether you can share at least the number of the uh, DA uh, users, I mean daily users, before you uh, purchased them, I mean acquired the game. Because... Hmm. Uh, 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 you see, there's like the, the, the idea here is like maybe there was like a hundred people playing it, and yeah, it, it's not a hundred. It's definitely many, many times more than that. It's okay. thousands of DAU, yeah, and, and then yeah. And so the follow-up question then is: mm -hmm. um, Have you tried to uh, measure, just to calculate, um, uh, how much you spend on the community development, and how how, how many people work there? Uh, whether it uh, really pays um, yeah. the same, like whether you pay the same bills as you would have paid. Uh, just doing like pure user acquisition. Yeah, yeah, good question. So you're, you're saying like, is there a dollar value to the efforts on community? That's a good question. I don't, we haven't done that exercise, but um, we had community people that have to support the game anyway, um, as, you know, because it doesn't make sense not to support them. So I feel like that's a, that's a cost that's kind of sunk with supporting a game no, no matter what. So there's no additional cost 
uh, to acquire new users is, is basically what I'm saying. Um, but it's an interesting question. I should, we could probably do that exercise and come up with something. Um, but actually, one of the interesting things is we have people that are help, you know, basically now that we have um, earned the trust of players, there are people within the community that are not employed by Deca Games that are also helping us, um, you know, when, when issues come up, right? And so they're like kind of key opinion leaders within the community. Um, and those are people that, you know, we're not paying that at all. They're happily help us for free. So it, it's an interesting question, and I'd like to see that number too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Sure. Uh, I have a short, short question. Mm -hmm. Did you finally get your money, your investment back? Or it's still Oh, yeah, things? absolutely. Absolutely. So um, basically, this was the first uh, acquisition for Deca Games when they, when they started the company. And <clears throat> I mean, one, it had to do with we were able to get a good deal on, on, on the game when we acquired it from Kabam. But yeah, we were able to make back our investment very quickly, like the company was almost profitable from day one. Yeah. So yeah, good question. Um, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, I wanted hi. to ask: uh, when you are taking in suggestions from your player base, how do you prioritize what should be done first and what should be done at all? Yeah, that's a really good question because, um, especially in the age of social media, there is a v this danger of like paying attention to a very, very loud and vocal minority of players. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we engaged a lot of the, the, the fans that know the game really well. Um, because there are a lot of people that are playing that are not making any noise that are really happy with it. So basically what we try to do is when someone is making a lot of noise about something, we'll sit down as a committee including the people that are in, in you know, uh, our super fans, to get their feedback on this. And then we kind of decide informally among that community. And then internally, we'll also discuss, OK, does it make sense? Is this good for the long-term health of the game and not just you know, a short-term tactic to drive revenue, right? Or, or, um, so it's kind of a, like a phased approach. Um, but yeah, we don't just, like, if it's two guys making a lot of noise, we, We'll listen to them, but we won't necessarily say, okay, we must do that because we hear them. We have to bounce it off of a lot of other knowledgeable people to make sure that it makes sense.